Moving on to the next project, which is from the Holborn Museum. And uh, it's called From the Inside Out, 18th century portraits meet 20th, 21st century science. And it involves a project which was looking at uh, research into the brain, 20th, 21st century so research into the brain, and uh, looking uh, with that uh, influence on 18th century portraits. And this is being presented for us by uh, Amina Wright, who is the senior curator at the Hoburn, um, and Louise Campion, learning and community engagement officer at, uh, at the, the Hoburn. I should say, uh, I know Amina of old because I employed her many, many years ago at Kenwood. So uh, over to you both. Hello. Um, we're going to share the story of a creative engagement project inspired by the Holborn's 18th century portrait collection. The Neuro Portraits Project developed out of a collaboration between the Holborn Museum's Gardner's Lodge Art Group, a local artist, and the University of Bath's Department of Science. So, there are more neurons in your head than stars in the galaxy. Neurons, um, for anybody that doesn't know, are the nerve cells which transmit uh, impulses in our brains. Sometimes the intensity of our own inner worlds, our consciousness, can feel overwhelming and lonely, rather like floating through the immense depths of space, as I think this image seems to convey. And this was an image created um, from the project. However, as social animals, we strive to find common ground. We try to find our own personal ways to connect with other people and understand them. The sparks of recognition when we do connect, yes, that happened to me, I know that feeling, help to validate our own experiences and make us feel less alone. Sometimes, if we're lucky, we experience these feelings when we recognise the familiar in art. The engagement project we're going to talk about sought to inspire such connections. However, these connections were between an art group, the Garden Sodge Art Group, and the Holborn's collection of 18th century portraits, separated by 250 years and a multitude of cultural and social differences. We're going to share the story of an art science collaboration and describing how the project evolved and the outcomes and the key lessons we learned. So, who was involved in the project? I'll start by talking about the Gardener's Lodge. The Holborn's mission statement, as you can see on our website, is changing lives through art, because we know that experiencing and being inspired by, by our diverse collection, art exhibitions and site, can have a really positive impact on our visitors' health and well-being. However, however, I'm sure everyone working in museums, museum sector know that there are some groups in our local communities who are less likely to visit museums due to a range of social, cultural and sometimes financial barriers. We're really fortunate at the Holborn because we're a free entry museum and this in theory should increase accessibility for those on low incomes. However, there are still many other reasons why people who could potentially benefit, um, for instance, people who are long-term unemployed, socially isolated, who um, have experienced mental health issues or um, long-term uh, physical uh, ill health may not come. Um, so for the last seven years, the Holborn has sought to actively reach out and engage with these groups of uh, sometimes marginalised adults in our local communities. Um, this work began as a partnership project with a local homeless night shelter called Julian House. Um, and it came out of a, of a recognition that the museum shared its surroundings with many rough sleepers who congregated in um, Sydney Gardens, which was a Georgian Pleasure Gardens um, is now a public park which surrounds the Holborn. Um, and here we have a, a very pixelated image of um, part of that outreach project um, 
at the night shelter, and you might recognise one of the people who definitely isn't homeless. <laughs> there, um, visiting the group. Um, so many of our participants that um, have come to the group uh, might have battled with uh, traumatic events in their lives, mental health issues, addiction, breakdown, and also poor physical health. Um, and some have made cho choices that have sort of put them outside of society, really. Um, but the fact that draws this diverse group of people together is really a love of art and an openness to creativity and the benefits this can bring in terms of well-being and self-confidence. So, the project. Um, every year, the Gardener's Lodge Art Group works towards exhibiting in Fringe Arts Bath, or FAB, um, a city-wide celebration of the arts which uses empty shop fronts and public spaces to showcase creati creativity in all its wild and wacky forms. Um, for instance, uh, having somebody sellotaped uh, to the floor for about two hours and not moving. Um, <laughs> Um, and this year, the group wanted to focus um, for that exhibition on portraiture. And I'd noticed how the 18th century portraits um, generated deeply felt responses. Uh, oh, this is the Gardener's Lodge Art Group. Sorry, I missed a slide. So here are some of the things that the Gardener's Lodge Art Group do. And this is the lodge it's, itself. So this is where we, where we meet. And these are just some of the projects we've, we've done um, and here is our, our picture gallery. Um, so I'd noticed how the 18th century portraits uh, generated really deeply felt responses in a number of participants, including Natasha, who expressed frustration that our portrait gallery was full of the faces of predominantly white male elite 18th century uh, high society, many of whom enjoyed family fortunes built on the slave trade. Uh, she felt she was unable to relate to the people and actively disliked what they stood for and the lack of alternative voices or narratives um, in the gallery. Um, another member of the Garners Lodge Art Group talked about the skewed moral compass which allowed wealthy families, such as the um, Oriel and Dashwood families, which we're going to look, look at in a Sophony painting in a minute, um, and the Holborn dynasty um, themselves, um, the, uh, this moral compass which allowed to sh them to show great tenderness and sensitivity to each other in their families, um, and yet be immune to the feelings of their, their servants and the injustices of the slave trade on which much of the we their wealth was built on. And he talked about circles of compassion, and he wondered how in general people decide where their compassion stops. Um, and I think that's really poignant at this moment in time in Europe when we're all asking those, those kind of questions. As we, uh, we read the mainly historical notes about each portrait, we began to wonder, as a group, was it possible to approach the portraits in another way, which created space to imagine the sitters' inner lives and their mental states? As one member of the group pointed out, mental health issues are not a 21st century discovery. Some of these people may have experienced depression, anxiety, uh, but society would not have recognised these conditions, and so there isn't uh, a trace. Um, walking around the galleries with Mina, um, it soon became apparent that some of the Holborn's most famous faces might indeed have experienced periods of poor mental health, and that there were potentially untold narratives which could be the starting points for new 21st century interpretations of our 18th century portraits. Uh, so with these in mind, we turn to local artist Stephen McGrath, whose own work explores the complexities of the human body and mind um, with an emphasis on microbiological microbiolo inscapes and neuroscience. Um, and members of the Gardner's Lodge group have been really fascinated by his previous exhibition, uh, which was called The Art of the Brain at the Fab the year before. Um, and here's one of his pieces. I don't know who you are, but I love you. Um, and this relates to a real-life situation where the person on, 
on the right in red with the sort of smaller, slightly atrophied brain is trying to work out who the person in green is. Um, they know they love them, but they don't know who they are. And in this case, it's his wife of 50 years attempting to care for his Alzheimer's. So that's just an example of one of Stephen's pieces of work. Um, Stephen's work with the public engagement department at the University of Bath um, has used art to share ideas and raise awareness of the current cutting-edge scientific research being undertaken there by the pharmacy and pharmacology department. The department's work on neuroscience aims to identify etiologies and improve treatment for a variety of neurological and neuropsychiatric disorders. So they develop, they're trying to develop drugs and also alternative therapeutic approaches that can positively impact on the lives of people with epilepsy, anxiety, depression, uh, drug addiction and Alzheimer's. So our project began with Dr. Denise Taylor from um, the pharmacology and pharmacy department sharing her department's work on mapping brain activity and how scientists are attempting to record neurological differences, differences in the brain uh, of people who are experiencing depression, dementia, stress, addiction and other conditions. Um, at times, this for the group was a really painful process, I think it's fair to say, um, and the parameters of the discussion really needed to be sensitively managed. I'm just going to show you some of the images. So we learned about the different parts of the brain and what they control, um, and we saw some amazing images. Some of them are computer generated. Um, this one shows the, the neural networks of the brain um, and we saw a lot about how electric electrical activity how the impulses in the brain can be measured um, and this image is very striking so what they're doing is they're comparing brains and looking at the, the dif dif different levels of electrical activity um, so um, Oh, sorry. Um, so this one, the, the red, yellow, and sort of the warm colours, this is more electrical activity, higher levels, and where it's blue, it's, it's less. Um, so we looked at some of these images, and again, this is a computer generated, but it shows the neural networks, and these are the impulses moving um, from one neuron to another. Um, so the other really interesting thing, the good news really from the research that we, we looked at was, was that there is something called neurone plasticity, plasticity, which means that your brain, there is possibility, even when you're older, for regrowth, regrowth new pathways, adaptation. So if you have had some kind of injury or something in your brain, you, you can regrow, you can learn new routes, which is really, you know, really positive message. And that also, good nutrition and health and exercise can really, uh, you know, have an effect on the brain. So you, you, you do have some control. So Stephen, also with a printmaker called Catherine Naylor, worked with the group for about eight weeks, um, taking inspiration from the beauty of these brain scans and the microscopic neural imaging, uh, as well as wider conversations about the brain. Um, and the group developed responses to some of the museum's portraits, um, reinterpreting the sitters from the outside um, in of the inside out, attempting to get beneath the skin and raise awareness of their possible psychological states. So now Amina and I um, are going to take you on an alternative tour of five of the, of the Holborn's portraits. So, um, this is Admiral Holborn. Lovely portrait by Reynolds, and it depicts the grandfather and father of the Holborn Museum's founder. Sir Thomas William Holborn, who founded the museum, 
owned this painting during the 19th century. His father, Sir Francis, was the little boy in the portrait. It hung in his dining room in Bath, alongside other family portraits and seascapes. Like his grandfather, the Admiral, Sir William was a sailor. Admiral Holborn had been a governor of the Naval Hospital at Greenwich at the end of his life, and he actually died in the hospital. So when his grandson, Sir William, died in 1874, he left this portrait to the hospital. The remainder of William's collection became the Holborn Museum, all except this portrait. So we are really grateful to Royal Museum's Greenwich for generously lending it back to us um, for a short period. I love this composition. I love the way that it combines elements of Reynolds's great uh, military and maritime uh, naval portraits of the 1750s with some of his most tender family pictures. So you have the image of a powerful naval commander who is also a daddy. He's also a loving protector of his child and by implication a loving protector of his men and of his country. Admiral Francis Holborn was nearly 50 years old when his son, the future Sir Francis Holborn, was born. He'd had a long career at sea and then he retired to shore duties with his new wife, a very wealthy widow called Frances Lassells, whom he met in Barbados. You can guess what's coming next, can't you? Um, like his wife, Admiral Holborn had considerable interests in Barbados. He spent a lot of time in the West Indies as a sailor and ran a plantation near Bridgetown. So the marriage between Holborn and Mrs. Lassells combined two fortunes, which had been built in Barbados. So um, I just want to um, read you uh, one of uh, the participants who um, was involved in creating their own re reinterpretation of this portrait. Uh, she says, I was drawn to my chosen portrait because the little boy just looked like he did not want to be there. <laughs> his father has wanted his son in the painting. He loves him, but he hasn't spe spent a lot of time with him. Look at how the boy's looking out to sea. His mind's on other things. He doesn't want to be there. He's bored. I think he'll suffer from depression when he's older. And this is uh, the the reinterpretation. Um, I call it Blue Boy, <laughs> but, uh, the Admiral's son. Um, here, Natasha has superimposed the sort of neural pathways of a brain scan onto the face, uh, using sort of blue to denote, denote depression, uh, as we saw in, in that uh, brain scan. It's as though the boy were looking out through a mental state which is slowly taking him over and in conversation Natasha suggested me to me that how the innocence of the boy would be corrupted by his family's connection with slavery really in the end. Um, after this Natasha was hooked and continued to research the painting uh, in her own time um, and she then uh, she'd previously questioned where the Holborn Museum, where William Holborn's, who was the, grand, the grandson of the Admiral, where the family money had come from for him to buy all the things that are now in the Holborn. Um, and she had a gut feeling it was from the transatlantic slave trade, and her research led her to Barbados. Um, and she decided to create a portrait that literally, as we can see, got under the skin of Admiral Holborn. And she included a mixture of symbols that reflected the Barbados part of his life, as you can see. Um, she says, I feel it depicts him as a man who exerted extreme power and control over people and places in order to make money, which would undoubtedly enable him to secure his livelihood. This enormous wealth meant that a legacy was passed down through the generations so that they could have great spending power and stay in control of their futures. Um, so our next portrait. The next portrait is Her Majesty's Queen Charlotte. It's a mid-1760s portrait um, attributed to Zoffany. 
when the museum acquired it in 1955, we now think it must be a studio copy uh, after a lost original by Zoffany. So this is uh, Queen Charlotte, Sophia Charlotte, the daughter of the Duke of mecklenburg strelitz She married King George, uh, who we met this morning, uh, as a young man in 1761. At the time of this portrait, she was still only 21 or 22, but already the mother of three or four children, two of whom, of course, were future kings. She and King George were very happily married, and admired uh, by some people as a model couple. She would go on to have another 11 children, finishing up with Princess Amelia in 1783, nine months before her 40th birthday. Five years after the birth of Princess Amelia, towards the end of 1788, her world was turned upside down when her husband fell ill. The king's mental collapse completely altered his behaviour towards her. He became hostile and suffered violent delusions, as well as all those strange physical symptoms. At the same time, Charlotte's son, the Prince of Wales, was using his father's illness as an opportunity to try and seize political power. And these events took a very heavy toll on the Queen's own mental health. Um, she never really fully recovered her peace of mind. Their marriage suffered. Um, in effect, her husband's illness took him away from her, as well as damaging her relationship with her children. Um, so, um, from this, um, Louise was interested in the number of children Queen Charlotte had had while still so young here. Um, this is her... Uh, interpretation. Um, so she explored postnatal depression through this abstract piece which references the fMRI brain scan image which again we saw earlier um, where we see the darkened brain um, to show this kind of dis depressed state and to me these delicate red dendrites which sort of float beneath it uh, are somehow reminiscent of all the kind of finery, the lace, and uh, of her of her sleeve hanging down. Um, so that's her interpretation. Now we come to the Zoffany conversation piece that Louise mentioned before. This is another long-term loan. We are so lucky that people just lend us amazing things. Um, it's a wonderful record of Zoffany's work in Bengal in the 1780s an informal conversation piece of the Oriole family with their friends and servants, and it, it really gives us a fascinating glimpse into this early colonial life in India. The tea party is probably set in the garden of James Peter Oriole. Um, he's the one in green here. He was secretary of the governing council of Bengal, one of five children of a Huguenot merchant from Hampstead, and here are all the five children. They all travelled to Calcutta during the 1770s and 80s to seek their fortunes. The brothers in the East India Company and the sisters in Rich Husbands. And both sisters married in 1782. Here they are with their husbands. So the sister in, in pink is Sophia, who was married to this gentleman, John Princip, who established the indigo and cotton printing industries in Bengal and became immensely rich. And then in green, Charlotte, who married uh, Mr. Dashwood here, Thomas Dashwood, who was in charge of stationary supplies for the East India Company, perhaps rather a boring sounding job, but an, again, one that was very lucrative. The names of the seven brothers and sisters have been added to the lower edge of the portrait. You might just be able to make them out. But there are actually five other people here, none of them named, of course, um, but all of them very clearly depicted, uh, delineated in great detail. We know exactly what their roles were within the household uh, from the way that they're dressed, 
We we know uh, which caste they came from. We know their social and religious background. And um, this is a really interesting document of how the British actually built upon the existing caste system, which was quite fluid, to um, actually reinforce people into their social positions according to their status in the household. So... Um Cliff, another participant, was drawn uh, not to the supposed focus of this ensemble piece, which are obviously the European ladies and gentlemen, um, but to the servant here, um, leaning to Porti in the centre of the painting. Um, here he is. Um, and this is Cliff's piece. Um, by deciding to create create this individual portrait of the anonymous servant, he's elevated his status. He's used the green-blue tones of the brain scans to create an aura around the head, and he describes the man as having his thoughts hijacked by his masters. He wrote, this is somebody who's been snatched out of their own life and then put into someone else's to serve them. He's there, but not there. No one else notices him, but the artist did, and Zoffany put him in the centre of the picture. Another politician from the 1760s with famous calves. Um, Art historically, this is a really important painting. Again, it's on loan. It doesn't belong to the museum. Um, but we're, we're very proud to have it because it's one of Gainsborough's first big life-size, full-length commissions made in Bath uh, from no less a personage than the Member of Parliament for Bristol. It was the first work that Gainsborough ever submitted to the Society of Artists exhibition. Um, he sent it from Bath actually to the Society's second exhibition in 1761, where it was catalogued as number 34, whole length of a gentleman. People love this portrait because its subject is obviously such a character. Um, I'll just give you a close-up of his face there. The very informal pose and direct gaze give a real sense of immediacy of a big man with a big personality filling a small space. This is Robert Craggs, who had been MP for Bristol since 1754. And uh, we have lots of contemporary descriptions of him. The poet Richard Glover, for instance, described him as a jovial and voluptuous Irishman. He was famous for his big voice, unflagging energy, and powerful physique. Um, Lord Chesterfield wrote him a letter in which he described his athletic calves, um, which is such a feature of this portrait. He's a great example of somebody from quite a modest background who rose rapidly through British society. His parents were Irish Catholic gentry, but by the time he died, he was an earl with £200,000. He was actually pretty unscrupulous in his ambitions. He was married three times, always to rich widows, and he used his wife's wealth for his own political advancement. Having said that, he was heavily criticised for his malice, his callousness in his personal life. But as a politician, um, if you look at his parliamentary record, he could also be quite compassionate. He supported some important humanitarian causes, particularly in Ireland. He was very loyal to Ireland, even if he let his family down. So next... Uh Responding to this, uh, we have John's portrait here, uh, which I think conveys the en energy of a man, a politician, firing on all cylinders, maybe George Osborne. Uh, <laughs> the electrical impulses in top of, on the top of the brain suggest intense neural activity. And John wrote, he has a defined expression, a politician's face. I think he's a devious chap. <laughs> I wanted to go beyond the surface, uh, beyond this surface impression to show his brain working. Now this one isn't really 
a portrait. Um, it's what the artist and his contemporaries would have known as a fancy picture. Um, so it's a fantasy figure painted for purely commercial purposes. In fact, at least seven other versions of this subject are known. Morland made a whole series of these um, very French style figures, often with the print market in mind. So um, housemaids, shop girls, ballad singers, uh, all of them very pretty, but not necessarily very true to life. Um, so this one is called a lady's maid soaping linen. She is not a laundry maid. She is not a, a drudge who spends all day in a laundry doing horrible work, uh, but somebody who uh, looks after a lady and is soaping uh, particularly fine linen, the lady's perhaps more intimate linen. So there's a bit of an innuendo going on in this picture. She's also rather too well-dressed for a maid. Uh, she has this very pretty figured gown, um, which gets costume historians very excited because uh, you see her sleeves here without the, the sleeve ruffles, the engageante, which uh, a lady would normally wear. Um, but uh, very typical print of the 1760s. So uh, Emma's... Uh, response to this. Um, so the colourful nature of this cross-section of a head creates a beautiful pattern um, and I think there's a definite attempt to reference the botanical leaves and patterns that we saw on the lady maid's fine gown. But it's not until we notice the disturbing mouth, uh, very sinister, sinister blackness, um, that we think again. Emma said, I wanted to show how this person might really be feeling uh, behind her enigmatic smile. Um, so finally, these portraits, along with quite a few others that we didn't have time to show, form part of um, the fab exhibition I was talking about, enjoyed by hundreds of people in Bath. Um, and the work, the work was also exhibited here um, at the Holborn Museum itself. Um, so, just to conclude, what were the positive outcomes uh, for the participants? Um, well, the pro project provided validation that mental health is and has always been um, an important aspect of life, which cuts across all boundaries of class, wealth, time. Um, the project provided a safe arena, arena to learn about and discuss research about the brain. Um, one of the participants said, I want to be able to show my friends this is what's happening in my brain, this is what it looks like, so they can understand. I think the group found a meaningful way of reconnecting with the portraits and people from over 250 years ago, and there was a real engagement with the collection. I've shown that people went off to research individual portraits further, they did their own research research and we sort of started talking about ideas about maybe doing a tour or presentation for the general public um, and I think there was a sense of empowerment having a voice in the community to express ideas about mental health and draw attention to this subject. In terms of the wider museum and, and Bath community, our visitors, um, the exhibition provided fascinating reinterpretations of paintings and people went back to the gallery and looked at the original paintings that inspired these. Um, and as a society, we're only recently beginning to break taboos around mental health and accept that our mental health is just as important as our physical health. According to MIND, one in four people in the UK will experience a mental health problem every year. So exhibitions like this that address these issues are part of a wider debate and they, they, they've been welcomed. This exhibition was welcomed by many people. What made it successful? Well, they're the things that make all... Uh, engagement project successful co-production um, which which means involving participants in the project planning um, identify uh, you know people the, the lead artist was found because people people in the group had seen his work they wanted to work with him um, making sure there are opportunities to feedback about the project we had some really interesting discussions uh, um, 
and also in terms of how the work's exhibited and um, making opportunities to sort of curate the work. We all got together, the group got together, we hung that show. Uh, not everybody, but a lot of people, we, we did it together. Also, partnership working, we work with the University of Bark, Bath, we work with the local artists and we work with FAB, um, which meant that we had lots of specialist knowledge and it was great because everybody brought energy to the project um, and we shared publicity um, and those contacts um, really, it meant that us as a museum, we didn't have to do everything. We all, we all worked together to, to make it happen. Um, and also, um, we have developed, uh, this, is own, this project is only part of a, of a, a continuing uh, Gardner's Lodge Art Group, and we've developed really strong working relationships with local health and social, social care agencies so that they refer people. They, they, they refer people to the group who they think would benefit, and it means we can just reach people that we would never be able to, um, to reach out to. Um, and time, you need time, and you need wonderful volunteers who are committed, which we have, which is fantastic, um, um, and time for people to talk, because these issues that we've been talking about today, mental health, it, it brings up a lot of stuff, and I don't know if any of you noticed that slide where it said normal brain and depressed brain. We had, as a group, a lot of discussions about this, um, and it's, you know, a lot of people felt very uncomfortable about those scientific words um, and didn't, didn't accept uh, some of the scientific explanations um, for the way our brains work. So um, thank you very much, and thank you to all, um, some of the members of the group who came to the talk as well. So the, the people that made that art are here as well, if you want to uh, talk to them. Thank you.